Parahandi, Master Mariner. A short, thick-set man with a red beard, a hard, round felt hat, ridiculously out of harmony with a blue pilot's jacket and trousers and a seaman's jersey, his hands immersed deeply in those pockets our fathers and the heroes of Rabley used to wear behind the front flap, he would have attracted my notice even if he had not, unaware of my presence so close behind him, been humming to himself the chorus of a song that used to be very popular on Gabbards, but is now gone out of date, like the captain with the whiskers took a sly glance at me. You may have heard it thirty years ago, before the steam puffer came in to sweep the sailing smack from all the seas that lie between Bowling and Stornoway. It runs, Young Monroe, he took an ocean for to sail across the sea, and he left his true love weeping all alone on Greenock And by that sign, and by his red beard, and by a curious gesture he had, as if he were now and then going to scratch his ear and only determined not to do it when his hand was up, I knew he was one of the Macfarlands. There were ten Macfarlands, all men, except one, and he was a valley, but the family did their best to conceal the fact and said he was away on the yachts and making that much money he had not time to write a scrape home. I think I ought to know you, I said to the vocalist with the hard hat. You are a Macfarlane, either the Beacon or Kale or the Nipper or Keep Dark or Parahandy. As sure as death, said he, I'm just Parahandy, and I ken your name fine, but... I canna just mind your face. He had turned round on the pole he sat on, without taking his hands from his pockets, and looked up at me where I stood beside him, watching a river steamer being warped into the pier. My goodness, he said about ten minutes later, when he had wormed my whole history out of me. And you'll be writing things for the papers, God bless me. Do you tell me you can be making a living off that? Oh, I'm not asking you, mind, how much you'll be making. Don't tell me, not a cheap, not a cheap. But I'll wager it's more than McLean, the minister. But, oh, I'm not saying it is not my business. The minister has two hundred in the year and a coo's grass. He's aye the big man up yonder. But it is me would like to show him that he was not so big a man as yourself, eh? <laughs> oh, but not a cheap, not a cheap. A Macfarlane would never put his nose into another man's oar. And where have you been this long while, I asked, having let it sink into his mind that there was no chance today of his learning my exact income, expenditure, and how much I had in the bank. Me, said he, oh, I'm going up and down like yon fellow in the scriptures, what was his name, uh, Samson, seeking what I may devour. I'm out of a job, just that, out of a job. You'll not be hearing of anybody in your line that is in want of a skipper. Skippers, I said, were in rare demand in my line of business. We hadn't used a skipper for years. I just that, just that. I only mentioned it in case. You were making things for newspapers, my God. What will they not do now for the penny? Well, that is it. I'm out of a job, just putting by the time. Oh, I'm not vexed for myself so much as for poor Doogie. Doogie was mate and I was skipper. I don't know if you can, the vital spark. The vital spark, I confessed, was well known to me as the most uncertain puffer that ever kept the old new year in Upper Loch Fine. That was her, said Macfarlane, almost weeping. There was never the bait of her, and I have sailed in her four years over twenty with my heart in my mouth for fear of her boiler. If you never saw the vital spark, She's all hold, with the boiler behind, four men and a derrick and a water butt, and a pan loaf in the forecastle. Oh, man, she was the beauty. She was just sublime. She should be carrying nothing but gentry for passengers, or nice genteel luggage for the shooting lodges. But there they would be spoiling her and rubbing all the paint off her with her coals and sand and whinstone and oak bark and timber and trash like that. I understood she had uh, one weakness at least, that her boiler was apt to prime. It's a lie, cried Macfarlane, quite furious. 
Her boiler never primed more than once a month, and that was not with fair play. If Doogie was here, he would tell you. I was as proud of that boat as the Duke of Argyle. I, or Lord Bredalbin. If you would see me walking about on her deck when we was lying at the quay, oh, there wasn't the like of it in the West Hillands. It was just sublime. She had a gold bead about her. It's no lie, I'm telling you. And I would be penting her out of my own pocket every time we went to Arran for gravel. She drawed four feet for it and nine aft, and she could go like the devil. I have heard it put at five knots, I said maliciously. Macfarlane bounded from his seat. Five knots, he cried. Show me the man that says five knots, and I will make him swallow the hatchet. Six knots, as sure as my name is Macfarlane. Many a time between the skate and otter. If Doogie was here, he would tell you. But I'm not bragging about her sailing. It was her looks. Man, she was smeared, smeared. Every time she was new painted, I would be putting on my Sunday clothes. There was a time yonder they would be calling me Two Flag Peter in Loch Fine. It was once the Queen had a jubilee and we had but the one flag. But a Macfarlane never was beat. And I put up the one flag and a regatta shirt. And I'm telling you, she looked just sublime. I forget who it was once told me. She was very wet, I cooed blandly. But with a headwind, the vital spark nearly went out altogether. Of course, people say nasty things about these hookers. They say she was very ill to trim, too. Macfarlane jumped up again, grinding his teeth and his face purple. He could hardly speak with indignation. Trum! he shouted. Did you say trum? You could trum her with the one hand behind your back, and you look in the other way. To the devil with your trum. And they would be saying she was wet. If Doogie was here, he would tell you. She would not take in one cup of water unless it was for signing out the dishes. She was that dry she would not wait a postage stamp unless we slung it over the side in a pail. She was sublime, just sublime. I'm telling you, there is not many men following the sea that could sail the vital spark the way I could. There is not a rock, no, nor a chucky stone inside the Cumber Heat that I do not have a name for. I would ken them fine in the dark by the smell, and that is not easy, I'm telling you. And I'm not one of your dry land sailors. I was once at Londonderry with her. We went at night, and did Doogie no go away and forget oil, so that we had no lamps and just had to sail in the dark with our ears wide open. If Doogie was here, he would tell you. And now and then, Doogie would be striking a match for fear of a collision. Where did he show it? I asked innocently. Forward or aft? Aft, said the mariner suspiciously. What for would it be aft? Do you mean to say that there could be a collision aft? I'm telling you, she could do her six knots before she cracked her shaft. It was in the bow, of course. Doogie had the matches. She was just sublime. A gold bead out of my own pocket. Four men in a derrick and a water butt and a pan loaf in the forecastle. My bonny wee vital spark. He began to show symptoms of tears, and I hate to see an ancient mariner's tears, so I hurriedly asked him how he had lost the command. I will tell you that, said he. It was Doogie's fault. We had yonder a cargo of coals for Tarbert, and we got doing the length of Greener going fine, fine. It was the day after the new year, and I was in fine trum, and Doogie said, Will we stand in here for orders? And so we went into Greenock for some marmalade, and did we no stay three days? Doogie and me was going about Greenock looking for signboards with Hill and names on them, and every signboard we could see with Campbell or McIntyre on it or Morrison, Doogie would go in and ask if the man came from Kilmartin or anywhere in about there. And if the man said no, Doogie would say, It's a great pity, for I have cousins of the same name, but... Uh, Maybe you'll have time to come out for a dram. Oh, Doogie was just sublime. Well, every day we would be getting sixpenny telegrams from the man the coals was for at Tarbert, but, oh, we did not think he was in such an awful hurry. 
And then he came himself to Greenock with the grenadier, and the only ones that was not in the police office was myself and the Derrick. He bailed the lads out of the police office, and now, he said, you will just sail her up as fast as you can, like smart lads, but my customers is waiting for their calls, and uh, I will go over and see my good sister at Helensborough, and go back to Tarbert the day after tomorrow. Who can we be going, and us with no money, said Doogie. Man, he was sublime. So the man gave me a paper pound of money, and went away to Helensborough. And Doogie was coiling up a hawser for it, ready to start from the quay. When he was away, Doogie said, we would uh, maybe just be as well to wait another tide. And I said, I didn't know, but what did he think? And he said, ach, of course. And we went all back into Greenup. Let me see that pound, said Doogie. And did I not give it to him? And then he rang the bell of the public house we were in and asked for four tacks and a wee hammer. When he got the four tacks and the wee hammer, he nailed the pound note on the door and said to the man, Just come in with a dram every time we ring the bell till that's done. If Tookie was here, he would tell you. Two days after that, the owner of the vital spark came down from Glasgow and five men with them and they went away with her to Tarbert. And so you lost the old command, I said, preparing to go off. Well, I hope something will turn up soon. There was some talk about a dram, said the mariner. I thought you said something about a dram, but, oh, there's no occasion. A week later, I'm glad to say, the captain and his old crew were reinstated on the vital spark. <laughs>